I'm Colin Katagiri. And I'm Mark Pacumpera. I'm a uh, research, research developer or uh, research, educational researcher and a program developer at Foundry 10. And I work specifically in our technology program, so robotics, auto technology, VR, and we'll get to more of that in a sec. And so today we're going to talk about uh, VR stories. Um, we have a, a VR study that we're running at, our, uh, at Foundry 10. And we work with a lot of teachers and students uh, in seeing what VR actually looks like in the classroom. And so we're going to share with you some of those stories today. So Foundry 10, uh, like Brittany was saying, we're an educational research organization. Uh, a lot of our uh, content and programs are developed by basically student voice or teacher voice. Um, drives a lot of our process and like we say, it's kind of non-traditional in a traditional field. Um, we think, uh, or we do that because we think a lot of areas that don't get um, you know, the attention that they need, like the arts and music, drama, like hip hop dance was one of our first programs, um, has a lot of value for students. Um, and when areas cut those programs, we try to come in, help them out, um, do stuff like that. You can catch us on foundry10.org. We're based out of Seattle. Um, and yeah, we do a lot of different programs. Um, like I said, yeah, Auto Tech, we built like a, a drag car, um, electric drag car that broke a world record, pretty cool. Um, video game design, media, tabletop games, robotics, et cetera, et cetera. And, and today we're going to talk about VR. Uh, so uh, the VR program that we ran first started when a teacher comes up to us. And so the way we're, we function is we don't necessarily go out and say this is what you need to do. We have teachers and students pitch us ideas about what they'd like to do. And if it's interesting and it's, you know, there's a lot to learn from it, then we actually put into effect. So a teacher came up to us and they, he basically wanted to say, this is around the, the DK1, DK2 kind of era for the Oculus. Uh, he wanted to see what um, you creating in Unity for VR would look like in his classroom. Can students actually do that? And what would be the value of that? And he ran a computer science class. Along with that, we had a university professor sit down with us and tell us, you can't, you can't put VR in a classroom in the, in, the, in the hands of middle schoolers and high schoolers and expect it to not be disastrous. And so we were like, we've seen some great things that, that students have done. So we actually put it in uh, seven different classrooms and we wanted to see exactly what was, what, what, what happened from there. And there's some interesting stuff that happened there. So from that, uh, a, lot of, a lot of the classrooms started, we, we studied content consumption and content creation. And we wanted to see what students would actually do with that and how would it actually look like in the classroom. We expanded that study, this was last year, and we expanded it this school year to 20 different schools that range from elementary all the way to high school. In addition to that, uh, some teachers caught wind of our study and wanted to participate, but we, were already start, we already started the study. So we took in 20 different partner schools, and basically they just wanted to, hey, I'd like a, you know, a, piece of, uh, so a piece of hardware, an Oculus, a Vive, or some Google Cardboards, uh, and I wanted to put some, uh, some of my, my students to that. And so we worked with them, and we got to see exactly what they did. So yeah, like Mark was saying, um, we didn't really have an agenda to push, except for like we wanted to see what might be the value of having virtual reality in a classroom. Um, a lot of the students and teachers that reached out to us kind of already knew about the industry, so they were asking for you know Google Cardboards, Oculus Rifts, HTC Vives, um, et cetera, as well as a, a multitude of other like software and experiences. Um, so we thought that was pretty cool because it allowed us to not only look at different subject areas, but also what the applications for different hardware sets might be. So like if you have a class set of like, you know, 30 Google Cardboards versus like one, you know, like top tier like Oculus Rift or HTC Vive in your classroom, what does that look like when you're, when you're dealing with different hardware, different subject areas, and um, yeah, different, oh, excuse me, different class sizes. Um, last year we were mainly looking at, because it was brand new, the development kits, um, what it looks like to actually implement it in the classroom, like what are the logistical barriers of like shipping it out. I think we were, I think we were in Toronto, um, but like so technically international, but we had 20 different schools going on mm -hmm. um, and looking at what it looks like to actually manage these classes um, because some of them were like art history, uh, humanities classes who didn't really deal too much with like the technical side of things um, and we also had some like AP computer science things so we just like lent them some stuff, they knew exactly what to do with it, how to troubleshoot, but a lot of people we kind of had to help them get over some hurdles. So we learned a lot um, about what teachers wanted to do and how we could actually get them started. Um, that helped us a lot this year as we were, you know, stepping up our level. I guess I said 20, we had seven last year, 20 this year. Um, we were looking more into like the perspective that the students are taking when they're going into these different experiences, like how immersed they can get. 
Um, also, classrooms, you might remember, are a lot noisier than like a clean, sterile like lab setting type thing. Mm -hmm. So like, what, what is actually breaking the immersiveness? Um, and looking at also at how VR content creates value specifically. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about the consumption and mm -hmm. creation side of things now. So we can't talk about our study without showing you some, some data. Uh, this was from the first year. Uh, basically, we asked them how VR could be used pre and post their initial use of VR. So right before they went into, say, a Vive uh, piece of content, uh, we asked them this. And a lot of them thought, you know, gaming. Uh, it's either between gaming or using it as a teaching tool. Uh, what's interesting is like that the language that was used, they wanted to see what Call of Duty was in VR. They wanted to play Portal in VR. It was taking a lot of games that they already knew and putting it into a new setting. And then once they got into that, the significant growth between the, the gaming and teaching tool um, was very interesting to us because now instead of actually just saying I'd want to uh, play Call of Duty, they were talking about I want to walk into a volcano. Volcanoes are very popular with kids, especially walking into them. I want to walk underwater. I want to, I want to learn about uh, different places, different biomes. But one school in Ohio, uh, a lot of the students would never really leave their, their town or you know, within the vicinity of that town. And so some of the kids were actually excited about seeing what it looked like to be in a subway in New York. And so that was interesting to us. Um, we, we got one teacher who recommended to us, uh, Keep Talking, Nobody Explodes, as a really good example for how they taught communication skills to their class. So basically the idea is that there's one student in the uh, experience in the headset, you can also do a desktop version, and the remaining students have like paper format um, where they can use laptops to be communicating with um, the student who's in the experience and diffusing this bomb. Um, and so we were able to recommend that out to other uh, teachers, and everybody seemed to have um, a pretty good experience with all of that, so yeah. And the next, the other side of that was the content creation. So we actually had an internship uh, of a few high schoolers come to us and pitch the idea of VR. They wanted to create a game. Uh, I don't, I think they had some, uh, some programming skills. Uh, and so they wanted to see what it would take to actually create one with limited skills. Uh, they pitched the idea of a 360 Guitar Hero type of game where music's playing, the bars come closer to you, as the bars come closer to you, you hit it with the, um, with the controllers. They finished this game, it's a three month, it's a three month internship, and they finished the game in like two, three weeks. Um, so we're like, what are you gonna do? What do you wanna do? And they were like, uh, we could make a new game, but they actually ended up, they, they realized at some point it was a proof of concept that they were able to play with 360 sound. So what they did from here was they added a narrative. So instead of just the bars coming close to you, they added wolves. Instead of music, they added growling and howling and barking. And they put you in an environment where it's pitch black and you had to light this fire and you hear the wolves come closer to you. So they took this proof of concept of sound coming towards you and they put a narrative behind it. And at the end of the, what was the name of the game called? Uh, Hearing Through Darkness. This is the intern right here, Ethan. <laughs> Hearing Through Darkness. Um, and it was, it was so good that PETA actually reached out to us and said, you guys should make that game. So we didn't, we, we yeah. had to stop it like unfortunately. Violence against an animated wolf. Yeah. But that was, that was interesting to us. So there was a lot of learning that happened with that content creation. So it wasn't necessarily saying, hey, you should learn about programming. They already had to learn about it. They understood they had, they had to learn about programming and um, 360 3D design from that process. So we talked about the study. We talked about some of the things that we've done. How are teachers actually using it in the classroom? And so Colin's going to talk to you about that. Yeah. So we have, like we said, a, a whole host of different schools going on. But we wanted to highlight a couple that we thought were doing really cool things. So um, Steve Isaacs out in uh, William Annan Middle School in New Jersey. Um, he's got these two classes that are really awesome in the approachability. Um, makes it really accessible. So if there's seventh grade uh, and an eighth grade class. The seventh grade class, it's a really short, like six week exploratory class that all seventh graders have to take. Um, and the idea behind this is that you know he's got an Oculus Rift, uh, he's got the DK1 version of that too, HTC Vive, like Xbox, Sony, PlayStation, etc. And the students are able to just kind of explore different content, different hardware with the uh, the guys that this is all about narrative story, narrative storytelling basically. So they're exploring different games and focusing on what it looks like to make a story. Um, and if they get Interest, uh, interest in that, they can continue on into their eighth grade class, which uh, is called uh, game design and development. Yeah. 
Um, it's a full semester for these eighth graders, and then they actually go into the actual coding, uh, graphic design. Um, and that, uh, but what's really cool is that they keep the exploratory element to it, and they can choose whatever hardware system that they liked from the seventh grade year, or um, choose something totally different um, with the ultimate goal that they create an or original game at the end. As you can notice here, on, on the floor, there is a shag carpet. He actually found a way for, for his students to stay away from the VR uh, area and not bother those in VR. So he used this carpet as a tactile way for the person in VR to know that they're in, within the, the area of VR and also a border for the rest of the class to not bother that area. Uh, so Luigi across the water um, in Naples, Italy. Uh, this student actually reached out to us. He heard about what we were doing um, and that you might be able to connect with us. Um, and he, he had this idea that he would create this VR developers class, um, which they later called uh, VEX for virtual experiment, or virtual experience, sorry. Um, we were kind of working with them and they competed in this contest there called the Big Hack. Um, I feel like it's probably not that in uh, Italian, but they, they, they did really well. They actually won um, in one of the categories and they got the support of their administration um, to, to buy them a Vive ready PC. So we shipped them out a, a Vive and at this point they couldn't, uh, yeah, Vive wasn't shipping to Italy, so it was probably one of the first ones to land over there. Mm -hmm. um, and in the bottom of the screen here, you can see some screenshots from the, uh, the, they redesigned their school basically in CAD and using some of the assets that are kind of open source, they made like some mini games, so they could play some basketball, archery, and then they also did like little character uh, profiles for the people who made the game, so yeah. Um, Back in the States, um, in Alabama, we have a, a teacher named Mark Connor who's working with a student who, it's a totally student-led class, um, or it's a club, sorry, not a class. Uh, it's after school every Wednesday. These kids meet um, with the advisory of Mark, and they're working on creating a really cool, um, it's electronic circuit simulation like puzzle game. I don't know if any of you are familiar with like Simulink. It's like a math works type thing, uh, but it basically introduces students to circuit design. They think, though, that in the format that it is, it's like a browser-based uh, application, that it's a little, there's like a barrier of entry to kind of understanding it that's kind of complicated. Um, and they think that if you use VR, where you're more immersed, it, it'll be more intuitive for them to design those circuits. And lastly, um, out in North Carolina, we've got um, uh, director, I'm going to mess this up, director of academic and digital learning for Surrey County Schools, Lucas Gillespie. Um, he's super cool. Um, he made, um, Basically, it's called, he calls it their VR room. Um, it's, in, it's hosted in one school, so they only have one HTC Vive, um, but this room is really well equipped, like couch, you know, you can see that monitor up there. Um, for basically, like, running as many kids through here as possible. Um, so he, he helps get the district um, and a bunch of teachers through here. So he ran some professional development before, like, the school year started, and he had a bunch of different teachers try it out so that when they um, were able to bring their students in later, they could request to do a field trip, try it out and they would all, um, yeah, get a chance to, to give it a go. Um, yeah, he also got Minecraft EDU to work in the Vive, which he thought like hadn't been done before. And this is only like a week or, week or two old, so hopefully you can give that a try soon too. Um, yeah. So it's uh, worth noting that for us, putting VR in the hands of teachers and students is really important. Um, and just seeing what they do with it. It's great things, because a lot of these teachers didn't know how it would work in the classroom. And just getting through those initial barriers, like the first year of the study, um, we've, we were able to help document some of, uh, like some models, like the hot seat model, small groups, what works best with, um, in large classrooms and things like that. And we wouldn't be able to do that without the actual teachers themselves. And so here's, we're gonna go into some of the popular uh, pieces of content uh, but how teachers were able to fit them into lessons. Because during this time, the Vive just came out. Um, there wasn't a lot of educational content directed towards specific units and lessons. So they had to pivot some of the content to fit the classroom. So I feel like we would all know the tilt brush at this point. If you don't, it's 360 paint, uh, paint experience, where um, most of the kids, if not all of them, really saw a, some value here. Even if they weren't in an art class, they were thrilled with the fact that you can do this when you're drawing, so this whole depth aspect. Um, on the right side, on the, is that right? Yep, on the right <laughs> side, uh, you see 
A, uh, a drawing, um, a student created a, kind of to scale from her perspective, um, scale uh, of some animals, like a zoo. So you can kind of see uh, a, a horse, I see uh, an elephant. Now, this was from a student who is a nonverbal autistic student. And what was interesting about this is the moment she put on the headset, she started playing. And she didn't even, she didn't move her feet. Everything is from exactly where she's standing, and they're all to scale. Now, a lot of the teachers and the students that uh, interact with, with her, they never got a sense of expression from her. So they never really got to know her personality. And this was the first time, so there was a, a lot of emotion that was going on in this, in this uh, particular instance. But it was an ability to take some uh, students who didn't have the, the chance to actually express themselves art, artfully wise from like a computer science class or other types of classes and actually create. Uh, the great thing about this is it doesn't take a lot of programming just to do that. You just have to know what the controls are like. So we thought that was interesting. And going into Modbox, which is kind of like Gary's Mod, uh, very similar to, like the controllers are very similar to uh, Tilt Brush. The great thing about this one is uh, students didn't necessarily have to learn about programming right away to create within VR. And so a lot of uh, teachers use this as kind of an entry point to actually designing an experience, 360 experiences. Um, of course, the kids who were excited about this <coughs> did start to learn about um, a 3D design. They started to learn about programming, coding, and things like that. So they found some kind of interest there, and then they went into it. And the blue. This is, this is a really popular one with kids. Uh, as adults, I'm like, whoa, this is amazing. And then you put a kid in it, and they're like, that whale scares me. And they freak out, and they never want to do VR again, which isn't true. Sometimes they come back. <laughs> but um, growing up, when I had a textbook, it would, I'd open it up. There would be a picture of a whale. And then right next to it is a picture of a human. And that's how I learned scale. I've never seen a blue whale in real life. Um, but then the kids actually got into this, and they saw how large this is. It actually got them to experience something that they can imagine. They've seen on TV many times, but they never actually got to experience. And so this is a, real, a, gr a great way for them to experience as close to real life as possible. The great thing about this one is as far as an entry point for VR, it has minimal inter interactivity. So it's, you can just be in it and kind of experience it and immerse yourself into it. And then going into the next like tilt brush or something with using the hand, the, uh, the hand controllers, that would be like a next step. A job simulator. There really wasn't a lot of pivoting for this one. <laughs> uh, kids and teachers just love this one. Uh, they saw it as, as soon as a vibe came into their, their uh, school or um, VR went into their school, they said, can we play Job Simulator? And I'm like, how did you know about that? It's their favorite YouTubers. Um, Job Simulator is one of the uh, most popular ones with the, with the youngins. Mm -hmm. So they knew already about it. Now the great thing about this one is, if you look at it from the terms of like a children's museum, where you're reenacting or role-playing different roles like a doctor, a fireman, uh, an astronaut. This fits in that realm. This is kind of an evolution to that. I remember going to, when I'm living in Seattle, the Seattle Children's Museum and riding, driving the bus. This is, I believe, far better. I mean, it's more than just doing this. You can eat the tomatoes. <laughs> Keep talking about explode. So uh, Colin talks about the hot seat model, about how even though VR, if you're just one person in a headset, you might, you might be isolated there, but having the rest of the class have maybe a page of the manual. And so if they yell things out, they're communicating with each other. Um, foreign language teachers, there was a French teacher who actually used this as a way to convey the target language um, conversationally. So uh, a student would talk in English and see what they're seeing, or talk about what they're seeing, and everyone else would have to talk back to that, that hot seat person in that target language, like French. They actually took that a step further and I don't know if they found, I think later on they found it, mm -hmm. but they actually trans, they pre-translated the manual for themselves so that they can talk about it later because they were finding that there was a, there's like a, a delay in having to translate and they actually, actually expressing what, what they see. And then blowing up. And then <laughs> blowing up because they stopped talking. Yeah. You know. But uh, also with the, the Spanish teachers use the blue as well as just how do you, how do you just convey what I'm seeing and just emotionally, you know? So you, we're usually trying to talk, you know, mm -hmm. expressing ourselves verbally and everything, but those kind of visceral like reactions, what are they like in that target language was very interesting to us. So what's next? Yeah. 
So uh, we're continuing our applied research in, the, in a subset of the schools that we're already active in. Um, again, focusing mainly on what, what content consumption and creation looks like for these uh, classes in different subject areas and different age groups. Um, hopefully we can get more specific on that as you know, developers start hearing um, like what information we've got and like the surveys that we've got from the students. Um, so that'll feed back hopefully from us developers and into the this, this students. Um, and as the second point says, um, we're hoping that we can connect our educators who are working in VR with other educators in VR, um, as well as uh, working to connect them with developers and actually make those, um, those dreams a real reality for them. Um, and also finding creative ways for these people to showcase the work. So like coming out to these events, and I was only able to talk about you know, a couple of the different teachers that, and students that we work with, but you know, there's, there's a ton more out there, and they're doing really interesting things, and we think this is really going to shape how education changes in the next couple of decades. Um, I mean, it already is, so. And all our research is, is open to the public uh, on our site, foundry10.org. Um, we're continuing the research. It's going to be ongoing, so we're actually trying to figure out what we want to do next year. And we're always interested with, of hearing what other teachers are doing. Even if, uh, if you're a developer uh, and you think of, you're thinking about creating something that is maybe even thinking in the sense that the students are kind of beta testers. I mean, you're not going to get a more honest group than a bunch of teenagers. Uh, but uh, seeing it from, a, from the, the teachers and a student standpoint, they're always looking for good content. Mm -hmm. And they're always creative in interesting ways to actually use VR. So yeah, if you know of any, any teachers or if you'd like to be connected with any, any teachers, just let us know. And here is a couple pictures of us. <laughs> when I had shorter hair. <laughs> but yeah, let us know if you know any uh, good teachers who have some interesting ideas or students who you think might fit this model of you know, exploring what, what applications you can do for VR and education. Mm -hmm. And I think we have some time for questions. Yeah, how are we on time for questions? Like five, yeah, cool. Yes. Do you guys take any neuroscience research or epigenetics research into what you do? I don't think we've gone that deep into it yet. Uh, I know we're doing, um, we were talking about some clinical psychology stuff, but nothing as far as neuroscience. Yeah, for yet. VR, we're we're doing like an experimental VR study right now. It's kind of ongoing, and I think we're nearly at. Yeah. The, we're looking for 80 subjects, and I think we're at like 60 or something. Focusing and more on the empathy type of what you learn through VR versus on a, a flat screen stuff yeah. like that. So that's in addition to the partner schools and the pilot programs where we're looking at creation and consumption. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Any other questions? Any educators out there? Cool. <laughs> cool. Oh, yeah. Uh, expand a little more about the, the uh, keep, <coughs> keep talking and the way it explodes. I mean, it, was that just having all of the kids talk and participate in that VR experience that the one student had the headset on? Yes, yeah. So the limitation there was obviously there's one headset to the whole classroom. And so the teacher was fi actually finding uh, issues that the class wasn't talking to each other. And so they, they implemented this, or they found this game. And they saw that it was working with a small group. And so they, they split up the manual to be with assigned kids. And so they would say, oh, I see this wire, and this wire, and this wire. Everyone's going to look through their, their page. And they're going to say, that's me. And so they would communicate back and forth that way. Uh, so yeah. Explored applications and like. Oh, thank you. Uh, hi, uh, I missed the uh, the first few slides, the first few minutes. But I was wondering if you guys have explored applications in like museum environments, mm -hmm. uh, anything like that. Yeah, we had a, a, a f an art teacher. Um, yeah, the VR museum of yeah, fine the, art. The, yeah, the VR museum. They we also used the the Van Gogh. Yeah, uh, what was it the night the cafe? night cafe? Um, this allowed students to just experience that art. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing about that is. They weren't able, there's that check-in point in the beginning of the, the application. They weren't able to get through that. And so actually getting them through. And so we, what was interesting about what we found was teachers that didn't have quite the, the computer savvy or the tech savvy um, were actually thinking about creative things, but they couldn't get it the initial, get yeah. through the initial barriers. The technical hurdles. Mm -hmm. Eventually got them over that, but yeah. Yeah. I, that, sorry, that actually, that stemmed into the whole content consumption to content creation. So as soon as they were able to see what you can do, like with, with the art, 
um, they were they started wanting to create with especially with pottery. So they used uh, the tilt brush and I think code on VR mm -hmm. to uh, start creating in that 360 space and prototyping that art before they actually create it in the real space. Yeah, so we adhere to whatever that the equipment is is stating. So like I think for the Oculus it is yeah, like 12 and up, 13 yeah, and, 12 up, 13 and, then and up, and then the Vive states older children. Yeah. Um, so on the elementary side we use more of the Google Cardboards. Uh, and then we do like a family night where the, pa the parents are there with the students and they can try some of the, the hardware, um, you know, for a very limited time. It was a slide that said as young as six. Yes, so, that, so we went to like a, a trade show and a, and a kid would, would try it. So we, I, we would at least have the, the parent there, mm -hmm. you know, and have parental consent. And it was just a very limited exposure, so it wasn't any lasting effects or anything. Yeah. Um, do you have any... Uh, experience dealing with training like the whole classroom all at once and how to use VR before they go in? Like have you done like on mass orientation? That's where Lucas Gillespie was coming in. He had he had uh, teachers talk about VR, about mm -hmm. um, some teachers actually use the Google VR to understand what that kind of frame, yeah. what, how, what to expect with kind, VR. Yeah, their expectations yeah. for it. And then they went into the Vive. And what they found was um, they would have to wait and so you would have like a whole classroom of kids waiting and everything. So we actually found that a small group model uh, would work best to wear like four to five kids. And so you'd have one kid um, clear, uh, coordinating off the, the, the area. You have another kid working on the computer, another kid in it. Uh, and then everybody else would be doing something else for the, in the classroom. And so the teachers would start to schedule things around it. So the, I mean the initial barrier of that one to 32 uh, ratio of tech to students mm -hmm. is really hard to get around and they had to find creative ways around it. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, especially when it gets to more affordable and equitable technology, you don't get quite the same immersion and interactivity. Yeah. So they have to kind of um, weigh it out for that. Mm -hmm. And then I think they expressed some concern too about like having the, the monitor there too because it would like kind of kill some of the immersiveness because they had already seen a little bit of, of it from the monitor like um, so they were thinking, you know, have have some of the students like sit and like not watch the students go through it, so then it can be kind of like brand new and exciting for them. So, cool. I think that's it for time. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Uh -huh.